continuing in book one, The Studio. Twelve. Gerlandio had not meant to deceive his apprentice. He summoned Michelangelo, showed him the overall plan for the death of the Virgin, added casually, I want you to collaborate with Granacci in this scene on the Apostles. Then we'll let you try your hand at the figures on the left, together with the little angel beside them. Granacci had not a jealous bone in him. Together they sketched the apostles, the one bald-headed, the other supporting the weeping John. Tomorrow morning, after Mass, said Granacci, let's come back to the studio and I'll start you at the bedrock. Granacci had been speaking literally. He put Michelangelo to work on the rock wall at the back of the studio yard. Your wall has to be sound. If it crumbles, your fresco goes with it. Check for saltpeter. The slightest patch and your paint will be eaten up. Avoid the sand that has been taken from too near the sea. Your lime should be old. I'll show you how to use a trowel to get a full smooth surface. Remember, plaster has to be beaten with the least possible amount of water to the consistency of butter. Michelangelo did as he had been instructed, but complained, Granacci, I want to draw with a pen, not a trowel. Granacci replied sharply, an artist has to be master of the grubbiest detail of his craft. If you don't know how to do the job, how can you expect a plasterer to get you a perfect surface? You're right. I'll beat it some more. When the mixture was right, Granacci handed Michelangelo a square board to be held in one hand and a flexible five-inch trowel with which to apply the plaster. Michelangelo soon had the feel of it. When the plaster had dried sufficiently, Granacci held an old studio cartoon against the wall while Michelangelo used the ivory pointing stick to outline several figures. Then, with Granacci still holding, took up the little bag of charcoal to fill the holes. Granacci removed the cartoon. The boy drew a connecting outline with red ochre, and when this had dried, dusted off the charcoal with a feather. Minardi came into the studio, saw what was going on, and forcibly turned Michelangelo to him. You must remember that fresh plaster changes its consistency. In the morning, you have to keep your colors liquid so that you don't choke up its pores. Towards sundown, they have to be kept liquid because the plaster will absorb less. The best time for painting is the middle of the day, but before you can apply colors, you have to learn how to grind them. You know there are only seven natural colors. Let's start with black. The colors came from the apothecary in walnut-sized pieces of pigment. A piece of Porphyry stone was used as a base, a porphyry pestle to grind with. Though the minimum grinding time was a half hour, no paint was allowed on a girl and dial panel that had been ground hard for less than two hours. My father was right, commented Michelangelo his hands and arms blackened with the pigment. To be an artist is first to be a manual laborer. Gerlandio had entered the studio. Hold on there, he exclaimed, 
Michelangelo, if you want a real mineral black, use this black chalk. If you want a slag black, you'll need to mix in a little mineral green. About this much on your knife. Warming to the situation, he threw off his cape. For the flesh colors, you have to mix two parts of the finest Sinopia with one part white well slacked lime. Let me show you the proportions. David appeared in the open door, one hand clutching a sheaf of bills, under his other arm an account book. What's the good of teaching him about colors, he exclaimed, if he doesn't know how to make his own brushes? Good ones are not always available. Look here, Michelangelo. These hog bristles are taken from white pigs, but be sure they're domestic. Use a pound of bristles to a brush. Bind them to a large stick like this. Michelangelo threw his stained arms ceilingward in mock despair. Help! You're crowding my whole three years of apprenticeship into one Sunday morning. When Granacci's fresco was ready, Michelangelo went up onto the scaffold to serve as his assistant. Gerlandile had not yet given him permission to handle a brush, but he worked for a week applying the intonaco and mixing colors. It was autumn by the time he completed his own drawings for the death of the Virgin and was ready to create his first fresco. The early October air was crisp and lucid. The crops were in, the wine pressed, the olive oil secure in big jars. The contadini were cutting back the trees and hauling home the branches for winter warmth. The fields were lying fallow as the foliage turned a russet brown to match the warm tan stones of the crenellated Signora Tower. The two friends climbed the scaffolding, loaded with buckets of plaster, water, brushes, mixing spoons, the cartoon, and colored sketches. Michelangelo laid a modest area of intonaco and held the carton of the white-haired and bearded near saint with the enormous eyes. He used the ivory stick, the charcoal bag, the red ochre, connecting line, the feather duster. Then he mixed his paints for the verdacio, which he applied with a soft brush to get a thin base. He picked up a finely pointed brush and with terra verde sketched the outstanding features, the powerful Roman nose, the deep-set eyes, the shoulder-long waving white hair and mustache flowing gracefully into the full-face beard. Freeland Glancing only once at his sketch, he put in the old man's neck, shoulder, and arm. Now ready to apply paint in earnest, he turned to Granacci with big eyes. I can't be of any more help to you, Michelangelo mio, responded Granacci. The rest is between you and God. Buona fortuna. Good luck with which he scrambled down the scaffolding. Michelangelo found himself alone at the top of the choir. Alone on his perch above the church and the world, for a moment he suffered vertigo. How different the church looked from up here, so vastly hollow and empty. In his nostrils was the dampness of the fresh plaster and the pungence of paint. His hand clamped the brush. He squeezed it between the fingers and thumb of his left hand, remembered that in the early morning he would have to keep his colors liquid, took a little terra verde, and began to shade all those parts of the face that would be darkest under the chin, the nose, the lips, the corners of the mouth, and the eyebrows. Only once did he go to the master of the studio for help. How do I mix the exact shade I had yesterday? By the weight on your knife of the amount you cut off the pigment cake. The hand can judge more accurately 
than the eye. For a week he worked alone. The studio stood by to assist if called, but no one intruded. This was his baptism. By the third day, everyone knew he was not following the rules. He was drawing anatomical nude bodies of male figures using for models two men he had sketched unloading in the old market, then draping them with robes, the reverse of the practice of suggesting a man's bones by the folds of a cloak. Gerlandio made no effort to stop or correct him, contending himself with a sotto voce. I'll draw them the way God made Adam. Michelangelo had never seen an angel, and so he did not know how to draw one. Even more perplexing was what to do about the wings, for no one could tell him whether they were made of flesh or some diaphanous material out of the wool or silk guild. Nor could anyone give him any information about the halo. Was it solid, like a metal, or atmospheric, like a rainbow? The youngsters ragged him mercifully. You're a fake, cried Sieco. Those are no wings at all. And a fraud, added Baldinelli. They fade into the robe so no one can see them. That halo could be taken for an accidental marking on a wall, contributed Tedesco. What's the matter? Aren't you a Christian? Haven't you any faith? Michelangelo grinned in sickly fashion. My angel is the carpenter's son downstairs of us. I asked his father to carve a pair of wings for him. His two figures were a distinct picture by themselves, located in the bottom corner of the lunette, under a cone-shaped mountain crowned by a castle. The rest of the lunette was crowded with more than twenty figures surrounding the Virgin's high-pillared bier, the saints and apostles, apocryphal faces set at slightly different angles of anguish. It was even difficult to find Mary. When Michelangelo came down from the scaffold the last time, Jacopo passed David's little black hat and everybody contributed a few scudi to buy wine. Jacopo raised the first toast to our new comrade, who will soon be apprenticed to Roselli. Michelangelo was hurt. Why do you say that? Because you've stolen the lunette. Michelangelo never had liked wine, but this cup of Chianti seemed particularly galling. Shut up with you now, Jacopo. I want no trouble. Late that afternoon, Gerlandio called him aside. He had said no word to Michelangelo about the fres his fresco, either of praise or criticism. It was as though he had never mounted the scaffold at all. He looked up from his desk, his eyes dark. They are saying, I am jealous. It is true. Oh, not of those two figures. They're immature and crude. If they stand out, it's not because they are better drawn, but because they don't fit into our studio style. My six-year-old, Rodolfo, comes closer to copying the Bottega method than you do. But let there be no mistake. I am jealous of what will ultimately be your ability to draw. Michelangelo suffered a rare moment of humility. Now what am I doing to you? Uh, now what am I going to do with you? Release you to Roselli? Assuredly not. There is plenty of work ahead in these remaining panels. Prepare the cartoon for the figures of the assistants on the right, and try not to make them stand out like bandaged toes. Michelangelo returned to the studio late that night, took his copies of Gerlandio's drawings out of the desk and put back the originals. The next morning, Gerlandio murmured as Michelangelo went by, Thank you for returning my drawings. I hope they have been helpful.
13. The valley of the Arno had the worst winter weather in Italy. The skies overhead were leaden. The cold had a creeping quality that permeated stone and wool and bit at the flesh within. After the cold came the rain, and the cobbled streets were running rivers. Anything not cobbled was a bog of mud. The only bright spot was the arrival of Isabella de Aragona on her way north to marry the Duke of Milan with her large train of ladies and gentlemen sumptuously gowned by her father, the Duke of Calabria. Gerlandio's studio had but one fireplace. Here the men sat at the semicircular table facing the flames, crowded together for warmth, their backs cold, but their fingers getting enough heat to enable them to work. Santa Maria Novella was even worse. The choir was as icy as an underground cave. Drafts that blew through the church rattled the planks and leather thongs of the scaffolding. It was like trying to paint in a high wind with one's nostrils breathing ice water. But if the winter was intense, it was brief. By March, the Tramotana had stopped blowing. The sun's rays had a little warmth in them again, and the skies were powdered with a touch of blue. On the second of these days, Granacci burst into the studio, his usually placid eyes blinking hard. Michelangelo had rarely seen his friend so keyed up. Come with me. I have something to show you. Granacci secured David's permission, and in a moment the two boys were in the street. Granacci guided Michelangelo across town toward the Piazza San Marco. They paused a moment as the procession passed, carrying relics of San Girolamo, a jaw and an arm bone, richly bound in silver and gold, from the altar of Santa Maria del Fiara. On the Via Larga, opposite one side of the church, was a gate. We go in here. He pushed the gate open. Michelangelo entered, stood confounded. It was an enormous oblong garden, with a small building or casino in the center. In front, and directly at the end of the straight path, was a pool, a fountain, and on a pedestal, a marble statue of a boy removing a thorn from his foot. On the wide porch of the casino, a group of young men were working at tables. All four walls of the garden were open legias, displaying antique marble busts of the Emperor Hadrian, of Scipio, the Emperor Augustus, Agrippina, Nero's mother, and numerous sleeping cupids. There was a straight path leading to the casino lined with cypresses, coming from each corner of the quadrangle and centering on the casino were other tree-lined paths curving through green lawns as big as meadows. Michelangelo could not take his eyes from the loggia of the casino where two men were working over a piece of stone, measuring and marking while several others were carving with toothed chisels. He turned to Granacci, stuttered, who, who, what is this? A sculpture garden, B but what for? A school. School? To train sculptors. His knees sagged. What sculptors? This garden belonged to Clarice de Medici. Lorenzo bought it for her to be her home in case of his death. Clarice died last July and Lorenzo has started a school for sculptors. He has brought in Bertoldo to teach. But Bertoldo is dead. No, he was only dying. Lorenzo had him carried here on a litter from Santo Spirito Hospital, showed him the garden, and told Bertoldo he must restore Florence to its days of greatness in sculpture. Bertoldo got off the litter and promised Lorenzo that the era 
of Giberti and Donatello would be recreated. Michelangelo's eyes devoured the garden, moving around the long legias, consuming statues, Grecian urns, vases, the bust of Plato beside the gate. That's Bertoldo now on the porch, said Granacci. I met him once. Shall I present you? Michelangelo shook his head up and down savagely. They walked down the gravel path, circled the pool and fountain. Half a dozen men from fifteen to thirty years old were working at board tables. Bertoldo, a figure so slight as to seem all spirit and no body, had his long white hair wrapped in a turban. His red cheeks glowed as he instructed two boys in roughing a piece of marble. Maestro Bertoldo, may I present my friend Michelangelo? Bertoldo looked up. He had light blue eyes and a soft voice that strangely carried over the blows of the hammer. He looked at Michelangelo. Who is your father? Lodovico di Leonardo Bonarato Simoni. I have heard the name. Do you work stone? Michelangelo's brain stood numb. Someone called to Bertoldo. He excused himself and went to the other end of the legia. Garnacci took Michelangelo's hand and led him through the rooms of the casino, one displaying Lorenzo's collection of cameos, coins, and medals, another ex examples from all the artists who had worked for the Medici family. Giberti, who won Lorenzo de Medici, de, uh, Giberti, who won Lorenzo de Medici's great-grandfather's contest for the baptistry doors, Donatello, who was Cosimo de' Medici's protege, Benozzo, Gozzoli, who had frescoed the chapel in their palace with portraits of the Medici in his journey of the wise men to Bethlehem. Here were Brunelleschi's models for the Duomo, Fra Angelico's drawings of saints for San Marco, Masaccio's sketches for the Church of the Carmine, a trove that staggered the boy. Granacci again took him by the hand, led him down the path to the gate and out into the Via Larga. Michelangelo sat at a bench in the Piazza San Marco with pigeons thronging about his feet, and the heel of his palm pressed his forehead bruisingly. When he looked up at Granacci, his eyes were feverish. Who are the apprentices? How did they get in? Lorenzo and Bertoldo chose them. Michelangelo groaned. And I have more than two years left at Gerlandiles. Mamma mia, I have destroyed myself. Pezienza, consoled Granacci. You are not an old man yet. When you've completed your apprenticeship. Patience, exploded Michelangelo. Granacci, I've got to get in. Now, I don't want to be a painter. I want to be a marvel carver. Now, how can I get admitted? You have to be invited. How do I get invited? I don't know. Then who does? Someone must. Stop pushing. You'll shove me clear off this bench. Michelangelo quieted. Tears of frustration came to his eyes. Oh, Granacci, have you ever wanted anything so hard you couldn't bear it? No, everything has always been there. How fortunate you are. Granacci gazed at the naked longing on his friend's face. Perhaps. 